Now, the way to actually get them, and we'll talk about them here in a second, is as follows. All right. First of all, if we want a monthly mortgage constant, you're going to start off with 12 payments per year. Okay. And then, you know, from there, obviously clear everything out. Then we'll start with the, the basic information, okay? In this case, we're going to start up here in the upper left-hand corner. So a five-year term, so five, shift in, and then the interest rate that we had there, I think the first interest rate was 5%. But the next piece is the part that really matters, and that is you're going to put in $1, okay? In this case, as your loan amount or your present value. And what you're going to be solving for is, oops, no, you're not, oops, back up there. You're going to be solving for payment. Okay, not shifting. All right. Now let me work a couple of these, and like I said, I'll, I'll explain how it all sort of works and fits together here. All right, fun, shift in, 5% interest rate, $1 present value. And then we solve the payment, and you're going to get negative 0, 1, 8, 8, 7, 1, 2. All right? So the number we're going to put up here is 0 0.018871122, and keep carrying it out. Now, the key here is that that number, we can take that number and multiply it by any loan amount, and that's going to give us our monthly payment for the loan. If it is a 5% loan for five years, okay? So my point, if those of you kind of coming in a few minutes late, back in the day, before kind of the financial calculators, before Excel, they would publish these books, and within the books, they would have these tables that would basically say, if you've got a, a five-year mortgage, 10-year, 15, 20, 30-year mortgage, and with these different interest rates, they would have what is called a mortgage a constant, or in this case, a monthly mortgage constant, that you can take this number and then simply multiply it by your loan amount. So, real simply, if we had a $100,000 mortgage, okay, you can pretty much multiply it out, and you're gonna see, you take that number that's there, multiply it by $100,000, so your monthly mortgage payment would be $1,887.12. Does that make sense? Okay. If you had a $50,000 mortgage, also multiply by that, if you had any dollar amount of the mortgage, it could be $10 million, $100 million, you still would multiply by that It's a 5% for five years. Does that make sense? It's conceptually. Okay. Now, so what we're going to do, just for you, go ahead and see if you can fill in kind of the remainder of this table sort of on your own. All you're going to be doing is changing the interest rate and changing the term and then resolving for um, effectively the payment. Okay? So this next one, all we would actually have to do is just put the 6% as our new interest rate, solve the payment, and then you should get 0 0.019328. Okay, then put in 7%, soft payment, 0 0.019832, okay, and I follow? Am I, uh, I got a negative? Is yeah, it's, it's, it is a negative, but I'm just taking that off because I don't really need it. Okay? All right, so now that if we switch down here, we would need to put in the 5% interest rate again, and then for 10 years, okay, change both the interest rate and the term to get back down to the next line. Then just change the interest rate. Okay. I don't know what's going to tease. I'm not necessarily going to fill all these in, but I just want to give you a 
a sliver of what this is basically. Okay. So, once again, in going through this, we can just kind of sort of see, if we kind of work our way down the page, as we were sort of saying, for a $100,000 loan, multiplying it by this mortgage loan constant would give us a mortgage payment of $1,887.12. Kind of moving down the page, then if it were a 10-year loan instead of a 5-year loan, the mortgage payment on a monthly basis would be $1,060. And if it was a 15-year loan, $790, 20-year loan, $659, 25-year loan, $584, and so forth, so on. Okay, does that make sense? That's it, one more time. <laughs> okay, so taking the 6% column at five years, our monthly mortgage payment would be $1,933 for 10 years, would be $1,110 for 15 years, $843 for 20 years, $716, and once again, so forth, so on. Okay? And the same thing for 7%, $1,980, $1,161, $898, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1
just another way of sort of looking at it just to kind of get a sense of uh, you know, how much longer the term or the higher the interest rate, what that's going to mean in terms of the amount of principal relative to the amount of interest that you can pay. Okay? All right. Any questions just on the basic calculation or just kind of what the mortgage constant is? Okay. Moving forward. Okay, the next one, a little different, is a price level adjusted mortgage. Another wacky sort of mortgage product. Okay, so this one were introduced probably in the 1970s somewhere. You don't see these very often anymore, but there are variations of them that exist. And what they are is, if you think about what we have done up to this point, you know, we obviously have, you know, are able to change the term of the loan in terms of how long the loan term is. We're able to turn, change the interest rate on the loan over time with an adjustable rate mortgage. Yes? What this does which is kind of interesting is depending on what inflation may be doing or not doing in terms of going up or going down, the balance on the loan gets adjusted upward or downward. Now think about it like this. Let's say that we're heading into a very high inflationary time period where real estate prices are, are going up you know, dramatically and um, but one of the loan products on offer is this price of the mortgage. What's going to happen is that over that time period, effectively you're going to owe more on that loan than you originally borrowed. It's not negative amortization so much as it is simply your balance is going to be increasing relative to what, like the consumer price index or some other sort of of a measure of inflation or some other sort of, of product that may be out there on offer. But the idea behind this, first of all, you would sort of say, why in the world would, once again, you as the borrower accept something like this? Usually, the reason, what is the one thing that we have said consistently that draws people in? Right. Low interest rate. So they're gonna give you a really low interest rate but they're going to pair that with this loan where your balance keeps going up. You follow? Okay. Yet again, another way in which the lender can kind of step in and potentially profit from the situation. Okay, so let's see how one of these works. Could it go down? Theoretically, yes. Practically, in most cases, whenever the lenders or premiums out there, they got a pretty good sense that you know everything is going up, but you know if you hold on to it long enough, there's a good chance that yeah, it'll go back down. So does it add to the principal? Yes. Okay. okay. So let's just sort of we'll start out 12 payments per year. Pull everything out, and okay, give me a dollar. Actually, this is to the hundred thousand. The math is going to be. Easy. $100,000 loan, I'll let you change the interest rates though. $100,000 is the loan amount, all right? So what interest rate do you want to start out with? 5%. 5%. Okay, and term, how many years? 15. 15, okay. All right, so let's first of all, just find out what our monthly payment's gonna be. So up to this point, nothing is, Unusual, okay. Okay, so our monthly payment seven ninety seventy nine. All right. Okay. Now, the way that these are going to work is typically what you're going to do is you're going to adjust the mortgage balance at the end of each year. Okay? So the lender is going to basically say, okay, we're going to look at whatever this index is or this consumer price index and some other sort of inflationary index, whatever it is. And so let's just say 
that at the end of year one, that index the value was going up a positive 2%. Okay? End of year two, let's say it goes up by 5%. All right? End of year three, let's say it goes down by 3%. Okay, if you use Jeff's sort of suggestion. All right? So, here's what we're going to do. You're going to find the balance at the end of the first year. Okay? Ninety-five thousand four hundred six fifteen. Okay, so everybody's good with that. That's our ending balance at the end of the first year. Normal mortgage payment of the seven ninety seventy-nine. Okay, so we've made no adjustments to anything at this point. That's okay, we're good. That's our balance. That's our balance. Okay. Now, the adjustment that we're going to make is very much like the adjustment that we make with like a prepayment penalty. Okay, you're just going to be in this case adding to the balance. But in this case, we're adding this inflationary sort of adjustment. So in this case, simply take it, multiply by 1.02. So that would raise our balance to 97,314.27. Okay? Does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? Okay, so much like the adjustable rate mortgage, now for the second year, we've got to treat it as if it was a brand new loan. Okay, so what we've got to do <coughs> is pretty much either clear everything, you pretty much just need to clear everything out. This is going to be easier. Okay, and now your new loan amount is going to be ninety-seven thousand three fourteen twenty-seven. Your new interest rate, there is no new interest rate, it's the same interest rate, so that's going to be five percent still. Okay, but your term is now going to be what? Fourteen. Fourteen years. Okay. And so you will have a new payment amount. So basically, the both would be adjustable mark inside of the time changes and changes the start of the You do. But keep in mind, what we did previously was we were changing the interest rate. Here, we're changing the balance of the loan. Okay? That's why that's, this one is called a price level adjusted mortgage. So you're not changing the interest rate, you're changing the balance of the loan based on a consumer price index. So the, the balance is either going to go up or it's going to go down. Basically, it's, it's, it, it was simply a way for lenders to creatively offer a lower interest rate while being able to effectively still get more money from Because think about it. If your interest rates are sky high, okay, and as they were in the 1970s, where you had certificates of deposit that, I mean, I remember having one as a, as a kid that was earning like 15% interest you know, and mortgages that were, you know, in that same range, okay? Well, the lender's saying, how can I create a product that will, at least on the face, look as though it's a low interest rate loan, so they offer you the low interest rate, but there's a big inflation adjustment on the balance at the end of each year, so that if, and because inflation's what's driving, you know, a lot of that, that higher interest rate, so, you may very well have a five or ten percent adjustment on the balance, you know, at the end of the year. So, in other words, the lenders are spending their money, and they're still going to get their rate of return, but it's going to be predicated on that adjustment that occurs. Did right? they use uh, tips for for a, um, a benchmark for these, like Treasury uh, inflation? Yeah. But every lender can still choose whatever sort of independent index that they may want to whether they use LIBOR, you know, whether they use some other sort of, of you know, government created index, 
of some sort <coughs> up to them. Okay. All right. So we get on this. Real fast. Fourteen. It's fourteen because you've already counted for the first year. That is correct. That is correct. You have fourteen years remaining. Okay. So our new payment is going to be eight hundred six sixty one. Let's say. Okay. All right. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? All right. Now, <clears throat> for the end of that second year, we're going to have a 5% adjustment. So we're going to go through the same thing. So is that 806 going to be the payment for that whole next year? Why don't you Correct. For one year, your payment will be 806.61. Okay. For the first year, it was 790 .79. For the first 12 months, for the next 12 months, the 806.61, and then the next one we'll see. Okay. All right. So one input 12. Then you go to the second year of the 14 year loan. If you do 12 input 24, it's going to be correct. Right. Because you're changing it each year, you're only going to be looking at the 12 months for that year. Okay. Okay, so our new balance is going to be 92, 388, 81. Okay, we're good with that. Okay, now we're going to adjust that upward by 5%, so we'll by 1.05. So the new adjusted balance is going to be 97,008.25. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? Now we're going to rinse and repeat one more time. Okay? Clear everything out. And then we're going to put in the 97,008.25. As our loan amount, interest rate is still 5%. Now our term is 13 years remaining. Okay, and let's see what our payment is going to be here for this year. Forty-six dollars ninety-four cents. Okay. So that's for all of the third year. Now then, let's get the balance. Balance nine one thousand five seventy one ninety two. Okay, but in this year, because of Jeff's suggestion, we're going to have a decrease in the balance because we're saying that basically the consumer price index or whatever index it is we're using is going down by three percent. So probably the easiest way to do that would be to simply say, okay, our balance is going to be what? 97%. In other words, 100 minus the 3%. So 97% of what it was. So in other words, just for those of you that are not following that, if it is basically 100% minus 3%, that's going to be 97%. Okay? All right. So times 0 0.97. So our balance 88, 824, 77. Okay? So in that year, it worked for us. It was a good thing. Okay? From the standpoint of our balance getting lower. All right? Any questions on that? <coughs> 
system. You adjust for that in index. You're adjusting from a base number, not from the previous number before. You're adjusting whatever the balance is of the loan at that particular point in time, either upward or downward from the balance. No, in terms of the, uh, of the like the like you're talking about the 0.97 that, that yep. represents the uh, that piece of three percent. Right. So in other words, what we were saying is that in that third year. We're saying that whatever the index was, it went down by 3%. Instead of going up, it went down. Okay. And the index is represented by uh, 1.0. Well, the, 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 the index value in this particular case is a negative 3%. It's gone down by 3%. So it's, it's much like saying that inflation has gone down by 3% this year. Right. Or inflation has gone up by 5%. So. We've got to make an adjustment then to whatever the balance of the loan is based upon what that particular index did, whether it went up or whether it went down. No, not, not from the balance, but from the, like where it says uh, times 1.02. Yep. So that point, that 1.02 is the, Oops. it represents the increase in year one. Yeah, you're, just simply you're just simply taking 1.0 right. or 100 that's times 100. basically and that's, well, you're at, well, not at it. You're adding the one, to that. The one is multiplying that number by itself. That's the multiplication. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be based on just that one. That's right. Like adding the previous. Right. Okay. So, in, in that example, if, if the interest rate actually went up, we would have then adjusted it by, let's say it went up by three, but it went times 1.03. Okay. 1.03. 1.03. Right. Yeah, just we'll make sure we're adding yep. anything outside. Oh. Can you take the present value at the end times three percent and subtract that out of it and give it the same answer? Potentially. No, no, I'm not saying it doesn't. I mean, I'm just, I haven't thought about it, but it's possible. Yeah. Okay. This, this is an adjustable balance, not an adjustable it's, a, it's an adjustable balance. Uh, that number, we got it again. That's the, that's the balance at the end of year three. Not, that's not the balance at the end of the loan, right? No. That is the balance at the end of year three. And so we're saying that at the end of the year three, if we were to pay off the loan, the payoff amount would be this at end of year three. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Can I connect you to the last one? I'm sorry? I'm just getting to the last one. Okay. So if it follows the market really closely, the lender could potentially offer you a really cheap um, really low yes. yes. engineered into Yes. That's precisely. So so Jeff, okay, Jeff is, is articulating it perfectly. So go ahead and just say what you just said. Because it follows the market so closely, the lender could offer you a super low teaser rate. And therefore, no exactly who's going to make it. Right, because in essence, it's going to then adjust accordingly with the uh, inflation index. Okay. So it's real rate return is fixed. Right. That's what that is. Yeah, but, but, I mean, it's not a bad deal for either party, really. Well, here's the thing it, it's, the whole idea behind it was to, once again, Create a product that's going to be attractive to the consumer based on overall high interest rates being offered by every other lender in town. So you've come up with this wonderful product that says, hey, we're going to offer you this relatively low interest rate for your mortgage, but the caveat is, yeah, at the end of the year, we're going to adjust the balance, you know, up or down, depending on what's happening in terms of inflation. Okay. And you know, but a lot of people would not necessarily be thinking, well, that's going to be a horrible thing or it's a good thing, you know, because in essence, if that is indeed true, what it would do, thinking of it like this, is what's really happening, and the people that are really paying attention to this and really thinking about it, is it's almost making the lender an equity player. Because they're basically getting kind of a preferred return in one sense, if you just want to kind of look at it from that perspective. In other words, they're keeping you as the homeowner or property owner from really gaining anything from price appreciation because all of that's being built into these indexes. Does everybody follow that? So, but if you, you had a really 
escalating property market that each year values of homes or values of buildings are going up two or three percent a year well once again who's getting that the lender not you as a homeowner now whenever you decide to go and sell chances are what's going to happen is you're going to find that your outstanding balance is not going to be insignificantly different than what your basically the, the sale price of the home will be adjusted for whatever paying paying down on the loan that you may have these percentages are always in addition to the original 5% loan. Correct. So you don't go in and like, when do you ever <coughs> go and change the 5% the, the or the... Uh, well, you the, could if you had... An adjustable rate more right? Yes. I mean, you could combine the two. Okay? You could get double damage. Okay? Yeah. But you could have a lender that says, okay, yeah, we're going to have an adjustable rate mortgage, but we're also going to have an adjustable balance mortgage. You know, I mean, you know the, they're literally the sky's the limit on, on being able to combine these different features and then create a product that appeals to the market because of some quirky market condition that may be you know, taking place. Right now, what have I you know, said that you know, you're beginning to see more and more as interest rates start to creep up? All of a sudden, here we go, all over again with basically um, you know, interest-only loans. They're coming back now. You know, and so and there's a reason for that because it makes it affordable. Yeah. And it's on paper. As the prices go up, it makes people can get into the place with these. Right, but, but, <laughs> but the problem is prices aren't going to go up. Prices are going to go down. Yeah, but, yeah. And now you're saying right. you have the precipice. Okay. Other questions? All right. It's kind of a general okay. question. Okay. So, I so if you're saying that the lender is able to, to capitalize off of you know overall appreciation of the property, but it's based on inflation. So in the, an inflation index based on your consumer you know price basket, of, does does the real estate market track that? Track that closer. to a T? Mm -hmm. Not maybe, <laughs> not maybe a, a complete one for one. But you know it's going to be relatively. You know, usually if one is moving up, the other one's moving up. And that would assume that real estate gains are made at a national level, not independent. To a, certain, yeah, to a certain extent, yes, because obviously at the local level, you may have all sorts of employment-related right. issues that may wildly swing it one direction or the other. Right. Interesting. Okay. All right. Okay, so I got lost in the third year because the question was that three percent you put five percent. Okay, the interest rate didn't change. Okay, for the third year. Okay. All right. So all you're doing is once again you're just taking the balance from the previous year, the five percent interest rate, and now you've paid off two years, so you're down to thirteen years. Okay. You get the, the payment. Then you go over get the balance. But because the index value is a negative number, you've got to subtract that from 100% to give you the 97% that you would actually be paying off. Because in other words, it's working in your favor under this circumstance as the borrower because that index has gone down in value. That means you owe less. Okay. Okay. But you still calculate the present value in the percent as 5%. Yes. The, the interest rate is still 5% on the loan. Oh, okay. The loan is still at a 5% interest rate because you're not adjusting the interest rate. You're adjusting the balance on the loan. Okay? So you can go through the whole cash flow thing and get a yield. Yeah. Okay. But we're not going to do that only because we've done it for the adjustable rate, so like, nobody knows how to do it. Okay, let's see. <coughs> All right, let's go back here. Okay, let's talk a little bit. I kind of mentioned this index rate. Okay, what is an index rate or an example of an index rate? Blackboard. Okay, LIBOR, CPI, Treasury bill, T bills. Okay, so in other words, you can have virtually anything be an index rate. In many cases, it may be a governmentally issued sort of rate. You know, whether it's once a quarter, once a month, once a year, whatever it may be. But 
it's an independent sort of index that a lender can choose to attach basically their sort of baseline to, okay? And so for a loan, you know, if you want to look at a lot of loans, like commercial loans, in many cases what you will see is the lender will say, we're gonna charge you 2% above LIBOR, or 2% above profit, or 2% above this or that and the other thing. Well, whatever that base is, that is sort of the index value, okay? Because it goes up, it goes down, you know, it essentially stays the same, depending on what may or may not be happening with the economy, what may or may not be happening with prices or interest rates, whatever it may be. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, on top of that index rate, you have a margin rate. Now, the margin rate is basically, the way I, I tend to sort of think of it, is it's basically it's the lender's sort of profit margin or it's the amount the lender charges above and beyond that index value. So the, let's just say that the index value is 5%. And then the lender says, okay, on top of that index value, to come up with the interest rate on your loan, I'm gonna charge you 2% above that. So that means your overall composite rate, see the term up there, would be 7%, okay? The index rate is 5%, the margin rate would be 2%, and the whole rate would be 7%. Does that make sense? Okay, the, or the composite rate would be 7%. Now, the margin normally is going to be kind of a fixed percentage based upon whatever the lender's internal requirements are. Now, it could change if they perceive one property they're loaning on to have a much higher risk than another property type. They can say, okay, well, we want to charge a higher margin on let's say office space than what we might charge on multifamily residential. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now one of the things that I sent to you I think this past week was just an example of a, of a rate sheet. Okay, did any of you take a look at that? Mm -hmm. Well what you probably saw, and we're just kind of remembering from memory, is that they had different property types and they sort of said that, that I think for multifamily residential it was one of the lowest in terms of the overall rate that they were charging. And one of the, the highest was maybe for hospitality or office, something like that. But you, know, you get the, the general idea. There is going to be a difference, okay, in that extra bit that they're going to be charging you, and that's where the, the, the margin will be coming into play. Now, <clears throat> so your composite rate is simply your index rate plus your margin rate gives you the composite rate. So the composite would be the overall. Yep, question. Do they typically the index rate to like say they're still like what the cost of their capital is if that's basically what it, it's going to indirectly be sort of of trying to mimic is whatever their maybe their cost of capital is <coughs> would be founded and that way they guarantee the margin right okay because I mean, the, 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 the thing about it is think about it like this okay you're a lender and <coughs> You know, yeah, it'd be nice if you could come in once a year and just sort of say, hey, this year our interest rate is going to be 5%. And all year long it's going to be 5%. And we may or may not raise it or lower it, you know, sometime next year when we feel like it. That's not the way it works, okay? Pretty much every morning the lenders wake up in the morning and the first thing they do or, you know, look at what these indexes, you know, have done. And then, you know, every day they're going to be adjusting whatever rate of interest that they're going to be putting out there for you getting loans or for them potentially, you know, paying interest on, you know, whether it's certificates of deposit or savings accounts or, or whatever else, okay? So it's a day-to-day -day kind of thing for them, okay? So they've got to have some sort of consistent sort of source, if you will, for their index that they're going to be using internally as a bank. Does that make sense? And that's what I'm saying, that on top of that, then they simply add whatever their normal margin would be depending on the risk profile of whatever it is that they're either lending on or what they're potentially giving in terms of a rate of return for a deposit. But then overall is the composite rate, everything combined, okay? Good, yes? 
All right. All right. Caps and floors. One of the things that a lender may put within, whether it's an adjustable rate mortgage would be most common, would be to say, all right, we're not going to be completely horrible. We're going to say, we're going to put a maximum cap on what your interest rate on the adjustable rate mortgage could be. So let's just say, hypothetically, your mortgage starts out at a 5% interest rate. They may say the most that it can go up per year is maybe 1%. But they may say it has a lifetime cap of 10%. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for example, if it starts out at 5% and next year the market has really gone up by let's say 3%, they can only go up because of that year-to-year -year cap of 1%, they can only go up 1%, okay? But then the following year, if the market is still up, they can add another percent. And the following year, another percent. But once they reach 10%, that's it for that loan, okay? Question? And that's independent of whatever the macroeconomic said? It's, it's basically, it's gonna be in your specific loan documentation, okay? Whatever loan documents that your lender gives you, it will say, you have a, once again, a year-to-year -year cap or a yearly cap of X percent and a lifetime cap of Y, okay? Now, in some instances, there are no caps, okay? So, I'm just saying, normally, they're going to put some sort of a cap in. Same thing on the floors. The floor would be how low can we go, okay? So they could also do just the reverse. They could say the most your loan interest rate could go down each year is 1%. But yet, maybe instead of saying that, and in that, if we sort of follow the opposite example, you'd be down to zero after five years. So they may say in that one, well, we've got a, a lifetime cap of it going down by 2%, maybe. Does that make sense? Okay. During a recession, I had a, 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 a arm, and it went down so far that they, because they, it went below the floor, because it was down to like 2.76, they changed the loan. There was some mechanism in there they, to get it back up to like a, it was a, a interest only, mm -hmm. to make it convert it back into a traditional mortgage, because it was just down to like, it was great for me, it went down from the thousand to five. Right. And then they converted, I'm like, wait a second. I mean, use it as all sorts of protections they're going to have in there for themselves. You know, that's the, the key. But, but the point being is you've got to look for yourself as to what protections that you have, you know, whatever it potentially is going to be going up, and, you know, that you're not going to be stuck with something that obviously the rate gets to, to a point of where you're not going to go afford it. Because as we showed last class session, you know, um, you know especially with teaser rates, that you know, if you have that introductory rate of one or two percent, and then all of a sudden, after six months or after a year, that jumps from one or two percent to maybe seven or eight percent, your monthly payment has gone through the roof. You can't probably afford it. Okay. Everybody cool with that? Yep. Question. During the session, professor, uh, the, the amount of um, this loan sometimes went so far down. How do the bank mark that in their balance sheet? In, in what way? I mean, when they mix these modifications, right? So the amount of the asset. I mean, they're going to have to adjust their their books as a, in, in terms of what sort of rate of return they're going to be generating. So how do they market in the balance sheet? Do they market as as as? Well, it's going to be a reduction of income to them. So that loan is not worth as much to them as it was previously. In terms of an asset, if you look at it as being to, to the lender, the loan is an asset, and if all of a sudden you're saying that an asset is not going to be delivering the same sort of rate of return that it was delivering, and that the value of that asset to them as the lender is going to go down. So the market, according to the, the market, the balance sheet, in a way, is, is well, yeah. the market or? Yes, market? Well, I mean, if, if they're going to mark to market, and they're going to specifically say on any given day or once a month, once a quarter, they're going to adjust those valuations. 
but at some point, yes, there's going to have to be an accounting of you know, what has happened to the market value of that loan and all the other loans in their portfolio. Now, all of that's on paper to a certain extent until, you know, potentially, um, you know, if, if the loan defaults, well, then they've got to do something. They've got to sell the property and potentially recover whatever they can, recover whatever losses. But if the property continues to pay, they simply are just going to have to adjust the the income stream that they were expecting to receive, therefore the value of that loan to them has gone down. But it could very well go back up again if interest rates obviously increase. Okay, moving on. All right, so we'll come, we're going to come back to assumable loans. Right now let's talk about the prepayments and lockouts for a second. So we've talked about prepayments up to this point, and we've said that you know typically don't really happen too often on residential loans, but on commercial loans, quite popular, quite prominent, that you know you're typically going to be paid a certain percentage of the outstanding mortgage balance, you know, if you pay off the loan early. Okay, that's really simple. What is a lockout provision? Now, I mean, before you answer that, it has nothing to do with locking the person out of the property. Okay? It has nothing to do with the keys locking them out of the property. The lockout provision on a loan is locking them out from prepaying the loan. Okay? So, what it means is the lender will say for the first five years, let's say, of this loan, or the first three years, whatever term they choose to use, you are locked out from prepaying this loan early. Now, in the event that you try to do so, the wrath of the lender will be upon you, okay, in the sense that they will impose ridiculous penalties above and beyond your standard normal prepayment penalty, okay? Um, and so you've got to be aware that, you know, if, if you really are thinking that, you know, the reason you bought, like for example, you know, a lot of properties that I bought over the years, commercial properties, I'd buy a commercial property, I'd renovate it, I'd get it up and running, fully occupied, and then sell it, okay? Because I'm not a property manager. I am, I am like, I absolutely hate property management. You know, you know, it's just like I am not a good person dealing with people, especially calling me up in the middle of the night about, you know, whatever it might be. So, you know, I am definitely the guy that, you know, love to buy the property, love to get it renovated, love to get it marketed and, and repositioned and, and sold. So the point, you know, you, you, you think about that. And if I were to go get a loan, and that loan said that I was precluded from prepaying that loan for five years, well, my time to buy the property, get it renovated, and potentially sell it might be, you know, under six months, might be nine months, might be a year, might be two years, depending on the complexity of the project. So if all of a sudden I'm going to be precluded from prepaying, I'm stuck with that property for maybe five years, well, within that five-year term, the market could go a completely different direction than what you know I was anticipating, and that means I've got to be a property manager for seven years, which is something I don't want to do. Okay, so you know this is something that you know you definitely need to be aware of and, and consider. Okay, all right. Moving on, I think the only one left on this little list is assumable loans. Okay. Is there any product that exists that like can come in and save the day for like uh, like a prepayment penalty? For instance, let's say you got a five-year uh, you know lockout, and is there any potential opportunity for a product that says, hey, you can come in, use this product to sell the property now, but it's going to allow you to maintain? The, the it all depends. Here's here's the thing. I understand exactly what you're asking in terms of is there something that you can kind of work your way around kind of how this all is sort of set up. Keep in mind, part of what the lender is trying to do is to lock in not only the certainty of those payments, but also lock in no additional paperwork, okay, on their part of having to deal with anything, think about anything. So the only way that you can 
possibly get around it, but even then, the lender can be really sneaky in terms of how they deal with it, is if the property is held as part of a corporation and you sell shares of the corporation to you know, different people, that then they can sell their shares in the property and then that way you know, no real change of ownership of the property has taken place, only basically shares of stock within the company that basically owns the property. Now, in some cases, that'll work perfectly fine because the lender is you know, none the wiser. It's just simply you make trades of, of, of shares of stock among your, amongst yourself and the shareholders. But in many instances, the problem is that the original loan was made to an original group of shareholders with certain financial statements that were back in the property, and if they were to get wind that you effectively have sold those shares to somebody else without their knowledge, they could, in essence, accelerate the loan, meaning that they say it's due and payable you know, immediately, but with penalty, and with a lot of penalty. So you take a big risk there. Yep. I want to ask you a quick question about what you said about um, what you do with uh, commercial properties, buy them. If you buy a commercial property and you put a business in there, um, does it affect the loan? And if so, yes. not the loan, sorry, does it affect it how much you can sell it for? And Absolutely. How? Well, the quality of the tenant. If you have a high quality tenant that you put into the property that, you know, you know, pick something out of the air. Let's uh -huh. say you put a Starbucks in there. Uh -huh. All right, that you know t technically is a high credit tenant. Uh -huh. That is going to be viewed very favorably to virtually anybody that comes along and wants to buy the property. But if you've got some sort of local mom and pop, you know, coffee shop that's a fresh start that has never, you know, been in business before, uh -huh. even though it's the same business. That mom and pop coffee shop is not going to be viewed nearly as favorably because chances are they don't have the strength in their balance sheet that if something were to go bad that they're going to be able to continue to pay their rent for the duration of the loan. Okay, so the appraiser looks at the tenant also in the Absolutely. Value commercial or should. Property. Should. Okay. okay now, right. not in all cases, but let's put it this way. It used to be the case that whenever you went to go get a commercial loan, you know, pretty much it was all based upon your personal sort of background, credit, you know, that sort of thing. And you would sign a personal guarantee for that loan that if anything went bad, they could come after you, okay? Then we kind of went through this period of where um, we could assign a lot of the risk to the tenants and take some of the burden off of the owner of the property and give them what would be called a non-recourse note. Okay, non-recourse means <clears throat> that in the event of a default, the lender can't come after the owner of the property personally. They have to look only to the property to get whatever yeah. dollars they can out of the property, but they can't come after you as a borrower and your personal assets, your other assets. Mm -hmm. Now, you can have a situation of where, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, personal guarantees and things like that, that you can have something that's called cross-collateralization, where if you have multiple properties, then you can say, okay, I've got five properties, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pledge all five of these properties collectively as collateral, so that if one of them blows up, maybe this one blows up in the sense of not being able to pay rent, and forces, you know, potentially a meltdown, then the lender can look to those remaining four properties to potentially get satisfaction. Um, but the, the, your question more specifically deals with, you know, whatever valuing the property and whatever loaning on the property, are the tenant, you know, how important are the tenants? Yeah. They're extremely important. Vacant versus? Well, no, yeah, not just vacant versus having a tenant, but the quality of those tenants, the quality of those cash flows, the length of the leases, the, um, you know, what sort of finish out would be, um, required to change occupancy because you think about certain tenants they have very specific needs you know within that space to where the tenant like for a restaurant let's just use that as an example going from a simple little retail store that sells you know clothing let's say they could use a room like this 
and really have no extra finish shopping. Yeah. But all of a sudden, you take that same retail space, and you say, okay, we're going to make that now a restaurant? Okay, you've got to put in not only you know the kitchen, but all of these other things attached to the kitchen, you know, vena hoods and you know probably extra bathrooms and extra sized bathrooms and you know a whole number of other you know things are going to be some very expensive fit out. And so, and then if they leave, you're probably not going to want to you know get rid of all that stuff. So you're probably be limited to a certain extent of saying, okay, well now I'm going to get another restaurant to move in there. So. There's a lot of moving pieces. All I'm, I'm trying to say is, yeah, the tenants do matter. What, who the tenants are, you know, what the the, the the cost is. Now, in a lot of cases, you also, as the owner of property, might just say, for especially for commercial space, that you can have a requirement that says, whatever the tenant puts into that property in terms of finish out, they're going to remove from the property whenever they vacate the property at the end of their lease yeah. so that they return it to basically what we would call white space of nothing more than four walls, a ceiling, and a floor, you know. And so anything they put in, whether it's tile, whether it's specialty lighting, specialty air conditioning, specialty plumbing, all of it has to be ripped out and brought back to the original sort of shell condition prior to, you know, their departure. Yeah. Okay. But then there's also... I'm not trying to avoid your questions. I know you guys have got some other questions. I'm just trying to run through a couple of different things here. So, you know, another you know piece of this is that, that from a commercial tenant perspective, um, who pays for that finish out also will influence the loan as well because it could very well be in weaker economic times. I, as the property owner may go in and do a lot of that finish out expense for you as a tenant. Whereas in a stronger economic climate where basically there are tenants chasing me down to try to get space, then I don't have to offer anything. They have to pay for all of their, their tenant finish out. Okay, so, but the, the point with that is that potentially affect the loan of the property if I have to roll that additional tenant fit out into the actual loan for the property. Now, maybe, maybe two separate loans, but in some cases you could, especially if you're doing a brand new construction, possibly roll it into both. Or, or into, into, I'm sorry, into a single one. Okay, all right, your question over here, a couple questions over there. Yes, it's about, um, about pledging you all for the assets. As yep. collateral. Yeah, cross collateralization. Is, is it a wise business decision? Well, it, it totally depends on what you're, you're doing. I mean, one instance I saw that was kind of interesting, you had a NBA basketball player several years ago that owned, I think it was like 45 Burger Kings, okay? And so in this particular instance, basically he cross-collateralized, you know, all the different Burger Kings, and part of the benefit of doing that is it allowed him to buy that many more Burger Kings yeah. because the lender was saying, all right, you know, in the event that one of them doesn't quite work out, well, I've got these others that I can potentially, you know, go after the cash flow from those others. So the, the benefit to the borrower is it may give you a much larger line of credit. The downside is, yeah, you could potentially lose everything, you know, in the event that, you know, more than two or three or four of these things, you know, begin to blow up. Okay, questions over here. I, I know I saw some hands up. But you answered. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else over here? Wow, okay, moving forward. All right, where was I going? Um, oh, thank you, Sumo Loans. All right.
There are probably are a few things and you know, strategies that you can employ, but um, I mean, most of the time, you know, as I said, you're usually just going to do it as just a, a measure to allow you to borrow a little bit or on similar property types. Okay, let's move on. Assume loans. All right. So, what may happen is you have a property that you purchased, you got a loan on that property, and then at some point in the future, you decide to sell the property to someone else, and you're, they're saying to you or you're saying to them, hey, the interest rate that you got on your loan was a really good interest rate, really good loan, um, and the interest rate that I'm going to get if I get a loan today is going to be a lousy interest rate, maybe with a lousy term. They're going to make me do all of this crazy due diligence to be able to get that loan, if I can even get a loan. So why don't you allow me to assume your loan, okay? And then there are all sorts of scenarios that we could kind of walk our way through with this. Um, many loans legally are not assumable, okay? But are assumed anyway, in many cases, okay? Because it's a, it's, it really is the question of if a lender finds out that you will allow this loan to become an assumable loan, once again, they can accelerate the loan potentially with penalties and, and so forth and so on. So, you, you know, if you're doing that, I don't advocate doing that, but, you know, that is, is something that potentially does happen. Yep. Does that affect the individual as well as the entity? Well, it can affect both. Because technically, as the person that let them assume the loan, you're still technically on the hook for the, the loan. And you okay. carry the liability. I'm sorry? And you carry the liability. And you carry the liability that in the event something you know happens. Because in most cases, it's going to be, it's probably not going to be a transfer of ownership. It's going to be more like a contract for deed. Okay? Now, just, to, just so everybody's kind of clear on that, how many of you have taken the law class? Any of you? Okay. What is the difference between a contract for deed and sort of a just a simple transfer of ownership? Transfer of ownership is deed. You get the deed and you, you own it. The other is just when you when you pay, you, you get the deed. Okay. So the, the contract for deed is kind of like a lease to own. Okay. It's the easiest sort of analogy to use. You know, you're basically saying, all right, I own the property and maybe I'm halfway through my mortgage, okay? Maybe it's a, let's just say it's a 30-year mortgage. I'm 15 years, you know, through the mortgage. I'm wanting to sell the property, but I got this amazing interest rate, you know, that was maybe like a 2% interest rate or something, fixed interest rate for 30 years. All right, so 15 years into that mortgage, somebody comes along and they want to buy my property, and maybe the current prevailing rates are 9% or 8.9%, okay? And so at that, you know, 8 or 9% interest rate, that means they're not, they're going to have a much higher mortgage payment than they would if they were able to assume my 2% interest rate loan. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and this is where hopefully those of you with, with a little bit of understanding of this, the wheels begin to start spinning in your head because <laughs> what you can do is then technically the value of that difference of the 2% versus the 8 or 9% loan, potentially you could get a big piece of that up front. In other words, be paid more for your property because of that cheaper source of financing. Does that make sense? So that's how you Yes. Yeah. Now, this whole thing of kind of the owner financing or this contract for deed thing, another piece of it that is interesting is that if you're becoming the de facto lender and you're allowing somebody to assume your loan, do you really care 
Or do they go through all the normal due diligence stuff associated with the loan? Of course not. You don't care where they go get an appraisal. You don't care where they go get a survey. You don't care where they go get any inspections. You don't care whether they do any of that stuff. All you care about is you're getting a mortgage payment every month, okay, to be able to you know pay off the remainder of the loan, and that they're hopefully good for being able to pay off the loan. Hey, you care about the credit, okay, in the sense of hopefully they're credit worthy enough that you're not going to get stuck with somebody who effectively is, is not able to make whatever that payment is. Question. Typically, I, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with it in, in residential, but do they collateralize? That is totally up to you as the sort of quasi seller in this deal that you know do you require a substantial down payment by the borrower some cases you do some cases you don't because once again that's kind of up to you you're really the lender in this circumstance and so you can just sort of say just start making me payments like for example if your payment were five hundred dollars a month all right you could say if you want to just be super nice, you just say, all right, you can just start making me payments of $500 a month, and we, you know, you make those payments for the remaining, you know, 15 years, and then, you know, at the end, then potentially come up with a lump sum to pay me for the the, the, the remainder, okay? You know, if you sell it or, or do whatever. But you can also sort of say, if your payments are currently $500 a month, you might say to her, if she wants to assume your loan, knowing that the best deal that she might be able to get is $1,000 a month for the same you know, property, that you might say to her, split the difference, pay me $750 for the next you know, 15 years. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. What I'm trying to understand is, like, under what document do they have like, the authority to, to possess the property? Well, in essence, they, for all intents, that's what I'm saying, it's pretty much a lease to own. So there is, is there a lease document? You would pretty much, you would create a document that would be a contract for deed. Yes. With a lease. With a lease probably provision and better than, assuming they're also the tenant, which is really where it happens most commonly. Yeah. Okay. So you know, you've got a tenant that maybe has been a tenant for, you know, many years. You're tired of having to manage the property, having to deal with the day-to-day -day operations, and you're saying to this tenant, here, take over, you know, collect the rents from the other tenants and potentially send me a check once a month and so I don't have to worry about it. So if you don't want your bank to find out, where do you go to get to the session? No, you're trying to create one. Oh, and then you get it notarized? I am in no way advocating this. You're asking me <laughs> questions about no, no, what, what I'm saying is it's going, the documentation, even if you own the property free and clear, okay, let's just kind of take that just as an example. If you own a property free and clear, you can still use a contract for deed. The contract for deed is just simply saying, I'm not going to give you ownership of this property until you fully, 100% pay off the loan on the property. It's pretty much the same way that a car title works, okay? But you really don't get full and complete title of that car until that final payment has been made. Okay, does that make sense? Whereas with most mortgage documents, and that's where it gets all kind of weird, because with most mortgage documents, you are technically the owner of the property, but you have a lien on the property, you know, from your lender that says, yeah, you owe us all this money, but you're technically the owner of the property. If you stop paying, you Yeah, they can take it back. Okay. But a contract for me makes it a little bit simpler because you never transfer the title, okay? So that if, if someone stops paying on a contract for deed, for the most part, you can just sort of say, okay, you missed a payment, I'm taking the property back. So that person can mess you up as well, though? Yeah, from the standpoint that, that if, if they stop paying, it's it's much faster than the foreclosure because it's not, there's no, there's no transfer of ownership. It's just simply, a two-party transaction that says you owe me this money and once you pay me all that money you get to take ownership of the property take title of the property but in the meantime it's really a lease okay make sense now i'm not an attorney let me maybe preface all that so all of those little intricate detail you know sort of questions you know as it gets into the legalities of that that is, you know, for you to ask your real estate law professor, who's David White's one coming up in uh, um, the, the winter term. 
Okay. So let's get back to the assumable thing here. Okay. So let's just kind of work through a couple of little examples on this. All right. So 12 payments per year. Clear everything out. And we had a hundred thousand dollar loan. And thirty years as the term. And the interest rate was let's say two percent. And we get our mortgage payment. So start with this. mortgage payment on that loan would be $369. Now we were saying that what if the prevailing interest rate was let's say 8 or 9 percent, so we'll just say 8 percent. Okay, so the difference between those two we're going to make this more complex here in a minute, but I just want to just kind of get the basics down in your mind. Okay, so the difference between those two, 733.76 minus 369.62, 364.14 is the difference. So this is the 8% loan, this is the 2% loan. Okay? Everybody comfortable with that? Yes or no? Okay. So just on a monthly basis, going back to this deal that we've talked about here, that if you've got this loan at 2% and the best that you can get is at 8%, then by being able to assume his loan, you would save yourself $364 a month. Okay? So I with me on that? Yes or no? All right. That is if he gives it to you scot free without making it. Right. Okay. Which he's probably not going to do because he's Angela. No. Okay. <laughs> Angela. <laughs> I'll give it to you for six five. All right. So basically, what one way of sort of looking at this is that just now this is making the assumption that the loan was done instantly at the time of you know, basically you got the loan and then literally the moment you got the loan then you had you know for, 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 the scenario could also be you got the loan at two percent because you have some sort of special arrangement with the lender and but she's not able to get that special arrangement so the best and, and it may actually be because her credit is not as solid as yours so therefore you know the eight percent Okay, and so we can work this so many different ways, but I just want to we can pitch it this way. So the point I want to try to make with this is if you just simply <coughs> take that and multiply that by 360 months, that's $131,090, okay, and that's basically interest savings. Okay? Does that make sense? All right? So the point being is that assumable loan you have has some value. Now, does it have $131,000 worth of value? Well, in a break-even sort of scenario, it does. Okay? But, you know, chances are she's going to say, you know, I don't want to do this, you know, if, if basically it's a, it's a break-even scenario. But the interesting thing is she might be willing to do that. And the reason is, for all those other things I mentioned earlier, with this, she doesn't have to go get an appraisal. She doesn't have to go get any sort of inspections. She doesn't have to go through the brain damage of compiling all the paperwork necessary for the loan. You know, all she has to do is just start making this guy payments. 
Who's still responsible for taxes? Yeah. And all that Technically, Angelo is the owner of the property until she has made the final payment to him. Okay? And so technically, he would be responsible for property taxes, insurance, that sort of thing, at least in terms of legally responsible. But the arrangement that he has with her is that she would be responsible for all property taxes, all maintenance, all repairs, you know, everything. So all he's doing is just simply collecting that overage, you know, each and every month for the next, you know, well, 30 years or 15 years, whatever the timeline is that we've determined. So this can be like written into a binding contract? Yes. So it's like a triple net lease with interest payments. Basically, Where yeah. you get ownership. Right. Okay. You can do almost anything you want to with it, but, but yes. The, 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 the point being is, okay, the simple lesson that I'm trying to convey with this is right. an assumable loan with a low interest rate has value. Okay? In other words, don't just give that up. Now, where these were really popular and have been popular is traditionally veterans administration loans have been assumable. Okay? And so you have someone that has served in the armed forces. They go out, they buy a property, they maybe live in it for, you know, a few years and they have a you know 15 year or whatever mortgage on the property and then at some point they say I want to sell the property and they realize well the interest rate I've got you know on this VA loan is at maybe three or four percent market rates are at seven or eight percent I can obviously you know take and, and structure a deal with somebody to where they can assume that loan and, and ultimately I can make some extra cash on the deal okay does that make sense mm -hmm. is it like a win-win situation or could it be like Someone could pick more than the other. Well, it's the, the only one that really, if you want to say loses, would be in, in one sense the lender. I mean, the traditional lender. Because you're basically taking business away from a traditional lender and, in essence, letting the whoever had the original mortgage with the lower interest rate um, uh, make a little bit of extra money off of the deal. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, let's do this. I can tell you're starting to get a little antsy. Take a quick little, let's say 9.30, before we're going to come back. Okay, quick little break. Oh,
3%. Okay, so let's start with that and get our monthly payment. And our monthly payment is going to be 13, 81, and 16. Okay, now we're going to take a little bit of a different tack here. When, during that 15 years, <clears throat> do we want to sell the property? 10 years. Okay, after 10 years? Okay. So that means five years are going to be remaining on the loan. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to find what the balance of the loan is going to be after 10 years. Okay, so to do that, it's going to be one. Input 120, 10 years times 12 months, 120 months. Shift, amortize, equal, equal, equal. So we're making the assumption, I'm just going to put off here, pay off <coughs> at end of year 10. Okay? Now, let's go ahead and calculate that. Okay, so we're still going to owe 76864 864 dollars I'll just round that up and do it like that. Okay, 86499 is going to be our uh, balance at the end of year 10. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay, now, what is going to be the prevailing interest rate at that 10th year timeline? 6.5. Okay. New interest rate at end of year 10 is going to be 6.5%. Okay? Everybody kosher with that? Yes or no? Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to basically treat this almost as a new loan. Okay, so clear all. And we're going to put in the $76,864.99. And we'll put this, just put it in as present value. Put that in as present value. Our term remaining is going to be for how many years? Five. Five years. Okay. Now, if we were to put in the 138116 as the payment amount, then what we would find is that our balance at the end of five years would be zero. We didn't adjust anything. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to say, um, and also the interest rate now is 10%. So with a 10% interest rate, let's put this in. Six oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, bring the, okay, try again. When you say okay, 6.5 is going to be our new interest rate. Then let's see what the payment would be. On that, okay. So my head, okay. When you say prevailing rate, that's the rate you're going to take to sell. Well, if the prevailing rate is whatever they can get out in the market. Right. Okay. Circumstances would be fifteen oh three ninety five. Yes. Okay. So what we could do is to simply take the difference between those two. Twenty-two 
$122.79 would be the difference between those, okay? Now, that is going to be a savings for how many months? 60 months. Okay, so what we can do... They like it. Okay. So we can go up here, once again, kind of clear everything out just to, to be safe, and put in the 122 79, we put it in as a positive or minus, or positive or negative, either way, but put it in as a payment. Put that for 60 months, okay, at the new interest rate of 6.5%, and solve for present value. Six thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars and sixty-three cents. So, <coughs> what this number represents. Let me do one more thing before I, I talk about that. So, in this case, we're basically saying one hundred twenty-two dollars seventy-nine cents times sixty months. Is seven thousand. $367.40. So that's your actual cash savings, okay, by assuming this loan. Does that make sense? Okay. One second. Okay. So the simple math, ignoring this for a second up here, just focusing down here. Your savings on a monthly basis on this assumable loan would be $122.79 per month for 60 months. Yes? So, in essence, what we're saving, saving by doing this assumable loan, the purchaser of the property is saving $7,300 of out-of-pocket money, okay? Now, discounting that money at the current prevailing interest rate of the 6.5%, up front, the most that they would be willing to pay you up front in hard cash currency to assume this loan, the most they would be willing to pay you would be 62 75 63 Now, that does not mean they're going to pay you that full amount because at that amount, they're breaking even, okay? But as we said earlier, in the event that they can avoid, you know, having to pay, you know, for an appraisal, you know, think about it. You start adding these things up. I mean, now if we're talking about commercial property, it's even more expensive. You know, commercial property appraisal, the cheapest I have ever seen has for a simple little property would be twenty five hundred to three thousand bucks. You know, for a complex property, you know, especially if it's a larger, you know, really complex property, it could be fifty, sixty thousand dollars for an appraisal. Okay. So now well, obviously this is a really small property, so it's not gonna be probably that much. But the but the point being is so you've got that cost to consider. You've got the all of the um, inspections, you've got all of the other assorted like survey fees and, and everything else to sort of consider. So it may very well make sense for you to just simply say, if you can avoid all of that stuff, to go ahead and write him a check because you'll still be breaking even, you know, relative to the, the, the extra um, payments that you're going to have to make to the lender. Okay. But assuming none of that matters to you, you know, it doesn't matter to you to have to pay for an appraisal. It doesn't matter if you have to pay for all this extra stuff, all these other closing costs. Okay. You may just kind of deal with him and just simply say, okay, I'm not going to pay you that full amount, but I'll pay you half of that. Well, it's still extra money. It's found money for him. Okay. And you're still saving money. Okay. But as I said, this is the most that you theoretically would be willing to pay, but you really factor in all those other savings, you might say, well, it might actually be worth you paying a little more. Yeah. Okay? This is not someone just taking over the loan. Yes, it is. So 
What about all the equity that was for the first team? Uh, in this case, this is talking strictly about the loan, the value of the assumable loan to the purchaser. This has nothing whatsoever to do with the value of the property. That would be a separate transaction, okay, that you would then potentially either take out a loan for the other 10 years worth of payments that have been made, or you would put that in as cash. We are simply talking about what is the value of the assumable loan. Right. So, so the value of the assumable loan is the present value? Of the loan. Correct. Not of the property. I got you. Okay, okay. Because we paid down, I mean, keep in mind, it was a $200,000 property. Uh -huh. We've paid down a hundred and, let's say, 24000 mm -hmm. Okay, so at a minimum, you would expect that, you know, on top of this assumable loan, that they're going to potentially have a note or a cash payment or something for that 125000 plus potentially any sort of price appreciation that may have gotten in there. What we're doing is just carving out just the assumable loan piece. Just the five years that's remaining. Correct. Correct. Okay. We can complicate it up, you know, by adding in all those other pieces, but we're just concerned about the assumable loan piece and the value of that assumable loan piece to a potential purchaser. Okay. So I over here had a question. I thought. So that that would be. I'm just thinking about it like uh, if I had a piece of property and somebody wanted to assume my loan at the end near like that five years left on the loan. Uh, I'm not going to give them what I paid it. So they're going to pay me, like you said, they're going to give me a check for the previous portion of it, whatever that's worth, and then, then they're going to they're gonna take over the loan. Right. Uh, and then potentially pay you a little bit of extra yeah. for the privilege of taking over that loan because they're going to be saving money. That's right. They're going to get a better interest rate than they can go right. again. I'm going to get the little right. extra for making that. Yeah, it's such well, it looks, it looks a lot better when you do it at a shorter period because then the, all the numbers are, the, that's bigger, the other part's smaller. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, the, the real value of the assumable loan is that you've got a really long term, you've got a long term remaining, and, and potentially there's a lot of value locked up in that. But, you know, this, you've only got five years left. You know, it's not like, you know, it's a, a big, you know, huge deal, you know, in terms of the, the real savings. I mean, you're only dealing with, you know, but on that previous example, you know, it was like, you know, hundred, you know, hundred thousand dollars would be present value of that. Yep. Why wouldn't they be willing to pay the seven three sixty seven? That's what you're saying. Well, because this is this is the present value of that in today's dollars. That's over five years. I mean, this is over the five years. Okay. Because under this scenario, this would be, you're, you're basically saying to the person, I'm going to give you a check right here today for 7300 He would gladly accept that. Is that the future value? Well, this is not really the future value. It is simply the total income that would be received by him over five years. But this is the discounted value of that today in today's dollars if you paid a lump sum to him today. today. It's kind of like the lottery. Yeah, yeah. You know how the lottery they say, okay, the prize is basically seventy three hundred dollars is the prize. But if you want to get a lump sum today in, to, in today's dollars, you discount it down to whatever today's dollars are worth in the prevailing interest rate. Okay. All right. Makes sense. So then the present value. I understand the discount rate, but somebody. Like in a practical terms? Well, in practical terms, all you're simply saying is you're willing to accept less money if you pay me right now, today. All of that money is savings. Right this minute, today, cash money, hard currency, check, right this minute, versus having to wait 60 months and her potentially making those payments to you for the next five years. That's all you're doing, is you're just discounting it because. Factor in well, you're taking basically what their cost of capital is. Okay. So, are obviously this cash flow is this lender? Is it going to be considered to him on top of that, on top of that um, loan? Again, all this is cash flow. I mean, the Who, whose cash flow are we talking about? I mean, this the 122 that he was supposed to pay to the lender. 
No, no. That's the savings. No, that, that's the savings. That's the savings. Yeah, that's the savings. That's the savings. Because he is still making payments to the lender of 1381, but his the purchaser would be making payments of 1503. To him. Okay. To him, which he then we get to keep $122 a month out of, okay? But that's a break-even scenario, okay? All right. What would the rate that the, the new buyer would be paying if he didn't? Six and a half percent. But his, not the rate, but the, uh, the payment would be? Uh, 1503.95. That's what he's gonna pay. If, if, if he, either assumes the loan, or she, assumes the loan, or doesn't assume the loan and go gets a market rate loan at 6.5%. Either way, they're basically going to be paying the 15 on free. What I'm saying is that there is still an opportunity for her to negotiate with him for something less than that if he's willing to accept it. So that's how I'm set my floor. Yeah, to a certain extent, this is, you're, you're saying, at a minimum, I want to get this yeah, today. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it, it also could be that that is her maximum, once again, in discounted dollars. Right. But at some point, there's got to be some negotiation that goes on. Yeah, but you can use that as your core yeah. because it's the same as that if you're financial. At, at the end of the day, you're going to be able to transparently, on both sides, see what you're getting, what you know she's saving, and, and you just basically say, well, if you're not willing to give me that, go find your own lender. But then again, you don't necessarily want her to do that because you're going to potentially pick up, you know, a nice little chunk of extra cash for doing nothing. Okay? So, you know, she has the leverage of saying, I'm going to walk out of here. I don't have to deal with this nonsense and, and go on and, and get her own loan and not have to ever deal with you ever again. Okay? All right, are we good with this? Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Let's, so that, that covers everything that will be on the new two quizzes that we will take today. Okay, so that's the dividing line. From this point forward, new material for quiz next week. Okay? All right. Yeah, but we still have we still have a quiz, we still have lecture, and we still have the test. Okay. We've got four hours we're gonna kill. Okay. A couple of hours will be the test, you know, thirty minutes, forty five minutes will be the quiz, and then the less rest will be the lecture. Now, keeping in mind that for the test next week, let's just kind of explain this process. I know that it's new to most of you. Some of you have me for the, the investments course and so kind of know how it all works. Okay, so once again, today we will be taking quizzes two and three. Okay, so at the end of today, you will have quiz grades for one, two, and three. If you are happy with the average of those three quiz grades, you do not have to take test number one which is at the end of class next week, okay? Does that make sense? So, in essence, next week you would show up, you'd listen to the, to the lecture, you'd take quiz number four, which is over the material we're covering now and a little bit remainder next week, and then after you're done with that, then you'd be saying, I'm out of here, okay? If you're not gonna be taking test number one. But if you're not happy with your quiz grades, quiz average for these first three quizzes, then yeah, I'm gonna hold you hostage and effectively, you know, have you take this test number one. Now, the difference between the quizzes and the test, which I mentioned the first, first day of class, just in case you've forgotten, the quizzes purposely, because we're covering it that day in some cases, that sort of thing, some cases, you know, whatever, the, the point being is it's open book, open notes, not open computer, not open native, okay? But open book, you know, open notes. The test is closed book. Closed notes, 
Closed computer, closed neighbor. Okay? All right? So the point is, by the time you get to that test, you will have taken the three quizzes, and you will see precisely what is going to be on the test. There's no new material. Okay? All I'll be basically doing is changing numbers for all intents and purposes. Okay? And maybe rewording a couple of little things just to make sure you're paying attention. All right? But outside of that, it's nothing new. Okay, does that make sense? So you should then take your time, study, reflect, you know, and be able to process everything so that you can come in and hopefully do well. Now, what I generally find is the people who, you know, have taken the quizzes, you know, there's, there's always a chance. Some people, they take it to heart, they maybe didn't do so well on the quizzes, they come in and they perform amazingly on the test, okay? They may have had a quiz average of a 60, and then they come into the test and pull off a 90. But then other people who may have, let's say, had a quiz average of a 90, get overconfident, come in to the test and pull a 70. Now the one that I, the grade that I'm going to record is the highest of the two. Okay, so there's no penalty for you taking the test if you choose to do so. But, you know, you're going to have to put effort in. And it's not just going to be oh, I did well on the first three quizzes, you're still going to you're gonna have to study, you're going to have to prepare, because it's closed book, closed notes. Does that make sense? Okay. Everybody understand? Yes? Okay. Moving forward. All right. So our last topic kind of begins to feed in to this topic a little bit, and something that's called incremental cost of borrowing. And simple way to sort of think about this is as follows. Let's say that we've got a loan, 12, excuse me, 12 payments per year, and let's say this loan is, we'll go with 100000 why not, 100000 loan. And the interest rate on this loan, we'll, we'll go ahead and do the 10% for 30 years. What the heck? All right. Just to keep it simple. All right, so we know that our monthly payment is going to be 877.57. All right. Now, over here, we have another lender. willing to lend us $80,000 at 8% for 30 years. And we get our payment. $87.01. All right? Now, let's assume that we've got the second lender, that, or third lender even, that says, we will loan you going to be, I don't know, let's say $400 a month. Is it a third lender? Yep. What's the interest rate? We're going to solve for that. So our payment is going to be a negative 400 and we're going to solve for the interest rate. $1,200. 
23.98%. Okay, we're going to start with, with it from this angle. Okay, so we basically have one lender we can borrow an entire $100,000 for or from for a 10% interest rate at 877.57. Or we can combine these two. Mm. 80 plus 20 would give us $100,000, but our initial interest rate on the first 80,000 is only at 8%. Okay, so we're thinking, woohoo, great deal. All right. And so our you know, monthly payment, 587.01, we're all good with that. And then we go to a, a secondary lender, credit card, credit card or whatever. <laughs> And, and the reason we do that is because this loan was so easy to get, this loan was such a low interest rate, we're thinking, all right, to get that remaining $20,000, we should be able to pick that up, you know, easy peasy, you know, no, no big deal. Well, we go and we find that the best deal we can get, quite frankly, is maybe our credit card um, on the property, because in essence, this is going to be the primary lien holder, okay? This one is going, in the, in the event of a foreclosure, you know, this one is going to be more protected than obviously the one with a junior position, okay? So this one's automatically going to charge you a higher interest rate. You maybe just don't know up front how much more it is, but what you're going to really find is, okay, well, yeah, um, you're borrowing the extra 20, um, you know, for the 30 years, but, you know, your, the payment for that is going to be $400 a month. Well, what that's going to translate into is your incremental cost of borrowing that extra twenty thousand dollars is basically twenty four percent yeah is is that how they the lenders usually do it for if you're buying a condo and you have to get like two if you don't have the twenty percent down you have to like do two mortgage they can do two different mortgages but then sometimes what they will do is they will create wow. a third instrument that would be basically a blended rate okay so now to do the blended one. rate and that's just, this will be the sort of the next sort of way of looking at this would be to say, all right, if we got the $100,000 loan and we added together the 587.01 plus the 400, and then whatever that equals, we make that a negative and put that in as our payment for 30 years, then the blended rate <coughs> would be whatever we get there as the interest. Okay? So 587.01 plus 400. 987.01 would be the payment. Okay, so let's back into this. Okay, so the blended rate would be 11.46. Well, now this, let's let's kind of reverse things a little bit and just think about it like this. Now, if they were just told, you know, if, they, if you were just sort of been faced with this up front, and this is what you were shown, that basically your overall rate for the $100,000 is 11.46, you probably would not have done this deal. Mm. You would have stuck with the original deal of 100000 and 10%. But you were potentially lured in by this other lender to get that easy, you know, 80% loan or $80,000 loan at that lower interest rate without realizing to get that final 20,000 was gonna cost you a heck of a lot more because of the junior position that they're taking you know, in the event of a foreclosure. Because in the event of a foreclosure, this guy's gonna be wiped out almost instantly. Okay, so they're gonna charge you a higher rate. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions? It, it gets a little more complicated in terms of the, the calculations because we would have to then say, okay, well, yeah, if we have a different term on this than this, and we have a different, you know, or on that. But I'm, I, 
I'm purposely setting it this way just so we're comparing apples to apples and we don't get confused. But yeah, it's very common that in a lot of these cases, what you may have is a 30-year loan for the primary mortgage, but then the secondary mortgage might be a five-year term. Okay? Or interest only. Or interest only or something else. You know. All right. Any questions on that? Feel reasonably comfortable? Yeah. So what, if I were to simply ask you, what is the incremental cost of borrowing the 20000 Would it be a dollar sign? No, no, okay. What is the incremental cost of borrowing the extra $20,000 as a percentage? It's 23.98% uh, is the incremental cost of borrowing the $20,000. Okay? Okay. Now, if I ask you what is the blended rate for the second sort of loan, the blended rate would be the 11.46. Okay, does that make sense? Yes or no? Okay. Do you make one payment and it's said like to an escrow loan? This once again depends on the lender because in some cases it may be as we're describing here. This could be one lender. And this is a totally separate lender. Oh, so the blending is just for the underwriter to see that potentially, yes, yeah. okay, or you, you know, yeah. it, and, but it also could be, which we're going to talk about later, are like wraparound loans, okay, which then you begin to basically do just that, get everything kind of the the new loan wraps around the old loan, okay. These are these are used a lot in condo, yeah, yeah. What, what about the five eighty seven one? What about it? Why, is it, why don't we use the 8% of the incremental? Well, the incremental is just how much are you borrowing above and beyond basically the 80000 <coughs> It'll be specifically asking me how much is the incremental rate for that 20000 Right. Not like... Right. Kind of so are you beginning to kind of get a sense that lenders are usually reasonably bright people that understand how to come up with all sorts of products to yeah. ultimately make things reasonably confusing, but yet hopefully make a little bit of extra money as a result of doing so? Hopefully, yes. All right. Okay. Are those, uh, those, those loans, that, the 20% the smaller loans, do they, do they typically have a lot of uh, prepayment penalties. And, uh, they could. I mean, it, once again, anything is almost possible. I mean, it really is in, in the sense of how these are structured. Because, as I said, lenders are retailers. So what they may set, what one lender may set as normal policy, another lender may set, do something slightly different. And the only reason they're doing something slightly different is to make it more appealing to you as a customer coming in off the street. Okay. I mean, it's like, think, think of it even, even in more simple terms, okay? And if you don't believe me about this whole lenders or retail, you know, how many times, you know, do you hear a lender say, okay, we're going to offer you free checking? Okay, well, what exactly is free checking? Okay, well, okay, you understand what I'm saying. They're, they're going to say, okay, well, you've got to have a minimum average daily balance of $10,000, okay, to have that free checking, all right? Or, you know, we're going to charge you $50 per insufficient funds. We're going to charge you, you know, this, that, and the other thing. The, the one thing is exactly the same. But they pull you in with the idea that you're going to get free checking. Okay? Well, it's the same way they're pulling you in with these mortgage loans because in many cases they're simply saying, we're going to give you the best interest rate in town, but what they don't tell you are all the other strings that they're going to attach to that best deal in town. That's my point. Okay? Why, why do they want to lend you the, the entire amount of the loan? Is it because of the loan to value? Yeah, think about it like this. They, most, most lenders want you to have some skin in the game. You know, they want you to not be able to just toss them the keys and walk away from the deal. Because they don't necessarily want to have to foreclose and go through the brain damage of foreclosing and all the legal costs and 
the uncertainty of what the payout is going to be. So, but beyond that is they want a cushion so that if you do just toss them the keys, that hopefully that 20% down payment that you made, that you're walking away from, that hopefully they are still going to be left with enough after everything is said and done, that they can be made whole in the, in the sense of, of um, whatever remains after the foreclosure process, but it's pretty close to that 80%. What do you mean by on the market value? Okay, in, in, what, in what respect? I mean, no, I understand what you mean by buying a under market value, but what, in what context are you asking? Say you buy a property that was $120,000, mm -hmm. but uh, <coughs> by the deal, instead of paying money for the money twice, I say, just pick up, just stop a property that's foreclosure. Mm -hmm. That's uh, people buying. So are you, uh, 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 okay. But what question are you asking me about? Supposing you're doing that, I mean, what effect is are you asking? In some cases, when when the house is worth more than yeah, no, I understand that. But I mean, okay, but under what? Okay. Well, are you still asking you to, to pay? You know, would that still ask you to pay to give like to put like twenty percent? Okay. All right. So the question, if I'm understanding it correctly, is all right. Let's say that you're buying a foreclosed property, and you're buying that property at below market value. Why would the lender still require you to put in a 20% or whatever it is down payment? Partially because, once again, they don't want to get burned. And they still want you to have some skin in the game because the market can still go down further. But also, it's, just, it's going to be normal standard practice for them to do that. But more importantly, what you can do in most instances is after you have potentially closed on the property, you have purchased the property, is if you can get a brand new appraisal for the property, you may be able to go to that same lender or probably a different lender, and if the market value is substantially higher, then you may be able to then move into a higher dollar amount loan for that property based upon what its perceived market value is. In other words, refinance. Which we haven't gotten to yet. Because in cases, some cases after the close, some buyer can still work out of the closing month and it's a check. Yeah, it's possible, yes. It happen. Yes. It's possible. Not likely, but possible. No. Okay. Let's see. All right. Um sure here where am I? take on a, a little bit of a different topic. One that I think you will enjoy talking about. Okay. Buy down loans. Question that we are gonna be both at the end or yes. Yeah. So I'm allocating about a hour, maybe hour and a half the most, okay? All right. Okay, a buy down loan. Basically, this is a strategy that's used and has been used by a lot of home builders, condo developers, that sort of thing, and whereas, they will give the initial purchasers of the properties, whether they're, again, condos or homes within a subdivision, a preferential lending rate, okay? And the reason that they do that is to try, sometimes successfully, <coughs> sometimes not, to try to establish a higher than normal price point for those initial sales, 
Okay? Does that make sense conceptually? Mm -hmm. Okay? One more time. So let's just let's just assume that you've built a bunch of condos and those condos, if you were to just value them, maybe they would be five hundred thousand dollars per condo or house or whatever. Okay? And we have some other comments on the condo we can talk about as well. But let's just say that five hundred thousand dollars per condo. But if you understand how market value works, what they're going to do is they're going to look at what other condos within that general area, if there are comparables, and they're going to see what they've sold for. You know, and the recency effect has a big influence. So the more recent the sales, the more dominance that's going to be given to you know those sales that have taken place. Um, but they're also going to look at the cost approach and you know look at how much it actually cost to construct these condos and you know the, the, the construction cost plus the land cost and, and so forth to try to establish what the value is, you know, since it's brand new construction. And you know, they may also look at it, you know, from the income approach of, of saying, okay, how much could we rent these things out for, you know, on a monthly basis and you know try to establish the value there. But if you're the initial developer of these condos, homes, whatever it may be, while you may think that is a fair number, $500,000, you probably want to try to maximize you know, your initial sales because you want to establish a strong initial price point. Because, like for example, if you were to sort of say, this is a brand new project and you take the attitude, we're going to give you a construction price or pre-construction price, sometimes that's a really bad deal for the developer because sometimes that pre-construction price will set the price point at an artificially low level and then they have to kind of recover from that because like for example let's say Angelo here bought this pre-construction at four hundred fifty thousand dollars okay so now Angelo's sale has been recorded as a sale as a matter of fact even though it's pre-construction it's still a sale okay well you know you come along and, and, and you know you are buying right at the moment it's opening and you look at, at Angelo's sale and you're saying, okay, well, why don't you sell it to me for, you know, $450,000? You know, you sold it to him for that. And the developer's saying, well, that was pre-construction. And you're saying, well, I don't care whether it's pre-construction or not. That's what he paid for it. You know, so technically that's established the market value. You follow me on this? Okay. Whereas, assume that instead of, of doing this whole pre-construction discounting, that, you know, Jeff came in and Jeff was offered a deal of we're going to set the price point at something greater than $500,000, but the enticement to Jeff is we're going to give him a really low interest rate, maybe even 0%, you know, for the first six months, first year, first five years, whatever it might be, to basically give him a true incentive to pay more for the property than what he ordinarily might pay. And so therefore, we maybe set the price point at 530,000, let's say, as the initial price point with the special financing, the buy down financing, all right? Does that make sense conceptually? We're gonna do the math here in a minute. But so you're used to the price point at 530,000. So now whenever you come along, you're saying, oh, well, you know, Jeff paid 530,000. Yeah, I still want it at 500, but, you know, you're also sort of saying, well, maybe the value really is 530,000, so maybe I should pay something pretty close to that, or maybe even more, because now it is, you know, the, the property is open for sale and, and, and so forth, so on. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in any of you that have worked in any sort of a sales capacity as it relates to new home sales or new condo sales, you know, every developer has their own sort of you know, scheme, I'll call it a scheme instead of a scam, a scheme to, you know, potentially try to lure in, you know, the initial, you know, purchasers or investors. And, you know, in each of those schemes is meant to, in one way, kind of manipulate market perception. Now, is it legal? In, in many cases, yeah. If you offer that below market, you know, financing to Jeff, um, you know, that's okay. And you're sort of accepting that you're going to do your due diligence and sort of see through that scheme 
and potentially not get hooked into it, all right? But in many cases, you may not see through it, and or the appraisers that are out there in the market may or may not see through it, okay? There's a question back here somewhere, I thought? No, okay. Oh. So maybe this would be, is this something that you would utilize if like say your, your price point in the surrounding area wasn't so great, you wanted to kind of set a precedent and be more of a, a higher price point, and so you would utilize something like this? Or you just want to make sure that you're getting the maximum value for the property you can. A gift card for furniture. Would that go for that same thing? Yeah, yeah because it's, 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 it's something that's going to convince the other players in the market that um, that is the established price point, whatever it is. But like, okay, the, the, the furniture thing, that's, another, that's a good one to use. Is there they could say, okay, we're going to give you ten thousand dollars worth of furniture. Um, so instead of paying us, you know, five hundred thousand dollars for the property, you might pay us five hundred and five thousand or five hundred and ten thousand or whatever, so that we can establish that initial price point. But we're not going to tell everybody else that you got free furniture. We're just going to simply say from that point forward, the new price point is this, without the free furniture, without the free landscaping, without the free whatever. Okay. Makes sense. What do you give me? Well, how much when, you know, they can, they can, they can, when you go to close, they can give you $20,000 back. Mm -hmm. we, we were over in uh, Fort Myers in, uh, um, uh, Co uh, not Codina, um, who's the big kind of developer down here? Um, George Perez built a, two towers, Oasis. They finished, there was not one person in the whole building. So when my partner and I went to build, buy a 240, 26th floor, 1800 square foot overlooking the whole city was a great deal but when we closed it was 300 and they they did some paperwork to make it 240 to set the market mm -hmm. and then we were like the first person in the building so that was setting the market similar to this they do it all kinds of ways builders yeah. builders do crazy right. stuff. in that right. case you have to use their lenders though no, it was cash oh, it's it doesn't matter we had the bottom line cash Lenders don't really like when you got cash guys. They don't care as long as it's two forty when they close. Having said, having said what you just said, and, and, and this is a great discussion to have because it all depends on, on also how public the sale is as well, and how much of that detail gets disclosed within whatever documentation you know, goes with that, and, and how much of a disclosure you know state Florida is relative to other states, and a whole variety of things. But my, the, the point with it is that. You know, if an appraiser, third-party appraiser, you know, is coming in, supposedly, you would hope, you would hope that they would do the due diligence to look at the sale and say, all right, there's some quirkiness going on here with, you know, how this deal was structured, and there is some below-market financing or buy-down financing or giving away of free furniture or this or that or the other thing, and that would be recorded as a matter of, of fact so that the price point would be adjusted relative to whatever those concessions were. But as a practical matter, sometimes that stuff never gets uncovered, never gets discovered, is never available, and so you have that kind of artificial price point, you know, coming out at the beginning that the, the, obviously the borrower or the, uh, the developer is hoping sticks and then it doesn't just plummet once, you know, things kind of get a little further down the, the, the pipe. Yep. In, in those cases, then you're still paying taxes on the value, the assessed value. You're going to be paying a higher tax rate on furniture that you just yeah. There's a lot of people that don't see the full circle, like Big Fish. D.R. Horton, my area, they go through. <laughs> no offense. But they, they like to do this nice little scheme, and unless you educate a buyer, they're saying, I'm buying, I'm paying closing costs. You go do your homework, they're not paying anything. And well, what, what happens terrible. to your build, builders is when they go in there and they build a product that, that is 300, but right. all the surrounding comps are 200, mm -hmm. Well, they have a margin, and they're in higher because if that's 30 years ago that house was built. Mm -hmm. So they got to get it up. If not, they lose money, and that's not their their thing, right? They, right. they got to get it up there. Right. So but that's a, like, that's a risk. It, so you don't want to go into a you know like these low uh, like habitat we build in some of these depressed areas. You're not going to get a your heart to come in here because no. they're not there to lose money. We do things differently, but if they can't get that selling price up, they're out. You know. So the, the, the simple moral to the story, 
if there you know is one, is you no, know, it's, it's very simple. It's, you know, it is a buyer beware sort of situation, and that. But unfortunately, this is getting back to what I was sort of saying. Not only are lenders retailers, but so are builders yep. and developers. Yep. They are retailers. They're trying to get you to come in and buy their product, yep. and so they're going to come up with all these wonderful things that they can market, you know, about their property, like you say, zero closing costs, giving you furniture, giving you a low interest rate, giving you, you know, who knows what, you know, free membership to the golf course or, you know, some other, you know, something. But at the end of the day, ultimately, all of it, all of it comes down to, you need to be able to figure out the cash flow stream that's going to be, you know, in terms of what you're going to be paying not only in the, the, the cost up front for the property, but in terms of the financing for the property, in terms of your property taxes, in terms of any other sort of tax implications that you may or may not have in terms of transactional, you know, or you know, even um, brokerage fees. Mm -hmm. Because if you're paying brokerage fees on that full price with the, the furniture, you know, once again, you're even paying higher brokerage fees. So I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's a cost to all these things, but yet <clears throat> the average ordinary consumer <laughs> Underinformed, uneducated, oblivious to these sorts of things. You know, um, they just simply think, "Ooh, you know, it's a sale today, and you know, we're going to get this wonderful deal, and everything is wonderful and great, and that sale's not going to be there tomorrow, so I better hurry up and buy today, and you know, and, and, and close on the deal." So that's the way to sort of think about this. So, okay, let's. Work through a little problem. All right. Any other questions or comments? Well, I was just going to make one more oh, thing. Was um, you know, I've I've had several listings where we, you know, you go into a community, they're establishing the value. It's a brand new community, and something happens. The person needs to move out of the community, and now they're stuck with a scenario where like. Most of the people that are traffic that are coming to that community, they're coming there, they have the ability to wait and build and build brand new, right? And so the people that just built this house, a year old home, and they're like, they, they can't sell it for what they built it for because the, the person's like, well, why would I buy a year old home versus getting a brand new one? And so you have to convince this person who just built a brand new house that you need to put your house on the market just a little bit lower or hope that someone comes in off the market. But traditionally, if you're buying a house that's Four hundred thousand dollars and up, you know, those people are, are waiting. They're not, you know, they want nice, brand new, fresh. So it, that's how that value can come back down too when those resales start coming right. into play. No, oh, absolutely. Okay. Other thoughts, comments, observations. Okay. Mm. All right. So let's just say that we've got this five hundred thousand uh, dollar condo. And we're going to just keep everything simple. We're going to sort of assume 100% financing just because I don't want to make it more complicated. All right. Okay. So, $500,000 loan for 30 years. Okay. And let's say that the current prevailing interest rate in the market is 7%. So let's go ahead and get our payment for that. financing deal that we're going to give away is 24 months at 3%. Okay. It's going to be the first 24 months of the loan. All right. So under that circumstance, let's go ahead and, and write here 3%. Payment would be 2108 
O2. Okay? So, let's explain, and we're going to do a few more calculations, but let's just make sure we explain what's going on here, just in case it's not clear. So, the prevailing rate of interest that your local lender is charging out in the market <coughs> is at 7%. Okay? What you are doing as the developer is you're saying you're going to work out a deal with that lender and you're going to say, I want to buy down that interest rate from 7% to 3% for the next 24 months. Is that right with me? Now, the lender is going to get the same amount of money regardless. You follow me? Mm -hmm. It's just you, as the developer, are going to eat that difference in cost. But the reason you're willing to eat it is because you're hoping that you're going to get a higher price point as a result of having done that. Because, once again, as we've talked about previously, most home purchasers are going to be, you know, um, approved on whatever loan that they get based upon their income and based upon what the initial interest rate is and so forth so on so they can probably get approved for a larger loan and be willing to maybe you know take on that commitment does that make sense okay so what we're going to do is kind of what we did a little bit before is take those find the difference between them Present value of that is going to be like twenty-seven thousand two hundred and fifteen dollars and nine cents, ten cents, somewhere around there. So technically, what you're going to have to do to the lender, I mean, depending on how you want to structure, you can either sort of say to the lender, "All right, I'll give you twenty-seven thousand two hundred fifteen dollars up front now," or I will just give you the extra 1218 per month for the next 24 months. Okay? So, but the but the, the point being is, okay, so this is your in one sense your upfront cost as a developer. Now hopefully what you're able to do with that is then adjust somehow the value, the initial price point on this above that and say, all right. Because I'm giving you basically thirty thousand dollars almost worth of savings over the next two years, that <coughs> should equate to pushing this price point north of five hundred. Now, is it going to push it a full thirty thousand dollars? Probably not. 
but it might push it up to, let's say, and, and there's no absolute as to what that is going to price it at. We can try to come up with some different scenarios, but let's say that it raises it by 15,000, you know, from 500,000 to, you know, 515,000. Well, then, in, in essence, after you've sold two of these, or if you did this maybe on one, but after you sold two, you made your money back. Okay, kind of thing. Does that make sense? And then, but obviously, multiple sales will then, you know, I mean, more than paying for it. I guess what I'm trying to get at that, you know, if you can, if all of a sudden your initial price point is at five fifteen versus five hundred, you know, all those subsequent sales, just think of that extra fifteen thousand dollars that you're maybe getting off those sales by doing something like this. Does that make sense? Well, how much is it costing you? So you can, you can either offer up front that or you can do the reduction. Right. The seller, the, right. the builder. Right. But if it's costing you $27,000, why are you? Because it's probably really worth four seventy. dollars Because you're able to set the price point at something higher than what it ordinarily would be. I mean, and think. And you're assuming that because more. of that, it's going to keep going up. Okay. Up up. Let, let's say that you've got 100 condos to sell. Okay. You want to set your initial price point as high as you can possibly set it. Because if you set it too low, then all of them are probably going to be at that lower level. But if you can set that price point up here, then you've got a little bit of wiggle room that you know you want it to sell all of them for an average of five hundred thousand. But if you can set the initial price point above that at let's say five hundred fifteen thousand, then hopefully you can maybe maintain that five hundred fifteen thousand. So fifteen thousand premium over a hundred condos. $15,000 premium times 100 condos, $1.5 million of extra found money for, for all for a little measly, you know, $30,000 investment. But it's not a one-time thing. No, it would be a one-time thing. It, it's all you're trying to do is you're trying to set the initial, the initial. Okay, I got you. That's why, that's why you're, you're, doing that's why you're trying to, to do all these extra little accoutrements for that initial buyer, the initial buyer is not necessarily getting a great deal. Let's let's put things in perspective. <laughs> the, 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 the property is really truly worth five hundred thousand dollars a unit. I thought you were doing this every time you sold. No 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 no. You just no. set doing it once to set the you're, buyer. You're, you're doing it once to sort of set initial price point. So you're putting in all of those extra little accoutrements to try to 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 hook. You know the initial you know person that is willing to take on that that higher than normal price point, and then everybody else just sort of follows and just automatically accepts. We thought you haven't. Right, okay. professor, you wouldn't subtract the three uh, the three percent from the seven and do the discount at four percent because really the uh, you could. Uh, I mean, I mean, another way, I mean, it would be a more um, uh, even a, a little bit of a higher number because you're not discounting it as much. Okay, all right, any other questions? Make sense? All right, let's see if there's anything else that I want to try to do today before I give you a couple of quizzes. All right, let's do a simple one. Home equity mortgage. Oh, that's a Okay. So, a home equity mortgage. What is the purpose of a home equity mortgage? Is to allow someone that has purchased a house, they've built up a bunch of equity in the home, you know, by paying down the, the loan, and so now they can borrow against it to pay for the necessities of life, whatever those may be. New boat. Okay, new boat, or you know, <laughs> pool, or kids' education, or you know, who knows what. Uh, Range Rover, <laughs> gambling losses, you know, whatever. Okay. All right. So, Range Rover and gambling losses. Let's assume that yeah, you have somebody. They bought a house for a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, in essence, they maybe have uh, paid off, let's say, 150000 
So they still owe 50000 So once again, this is original purchase price. This is all just the, uh, the principal too. Yeah. Okay, so the original purchase price, this is, once again, um, debt paid off. This is remaining debt. Okay, now, currently, the house is valued at 300000 Yeah. Now, with a home equity loan, they can have a total debt to value ratio of 75%. Okay? So, how much can they get as a home equity loan? All right? So, what you're going to do is you're going to say the current market value is $300,000. All right? And we were to say, all right, 70, we'll start with this, 75% of that amount, I'm going to start with that, so 300,000 times 75% would be 225,000, okay, but they still owe 50,000, so that would mean, One hundred seventy-five thousand would be the maximum home equity loan. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody, you know, that's always going to be simple. Okay. So, what are some of the issues that I guess you need to be thinking about or be concerned with as it relates to something like a home equity loan? Credit. Somebody said credit. Okay, well, in what respect? Uh, it's like it's like applying for a new mortgage, right? Yeah, in essence, yeah, because you're taking on more debt, so you know that is going to potentially you know impact your credit score. That's okay. How's it going to be? I'm sorry. Because how's it going to be? Yeah. Well, well, what happens if the market value goes down over this time period? Yeah, you end up owing more on the the, the house than what it's worth. So that's, you're going to be you know, concerned about the current interest rate because you know, it may very well be that just because you can borrow that 175000 you may not like the interest rate associated with it. Okay? But usually, usually, a home equity mortgage will give you a lower interest rate than you would be able to get, let's say, than on obviously borrowing or like an unsecured line of credit. But it may be, in most cases, a little bit of a higher interest rate than would be on a brand new mortgage. Okay? Plus it was tax, I don't know if it's still tax deductible, but. I believe it would be. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that's no, one, one of the things was not potentially. I think it's only second homes they did that too. Yeah, second homes are, they, they, they're, they're out out. slaughtered. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's your pay? Are we comfortable just with this little simple calculation? Any questions on that? Okay. So, anyway, the, the whole point of this is just simply a way that you can potentially pull value out of your Now, keep in mind, this can also work on commercial properties. Okay, same general concept, but we call it a home equity loan. It's maybe a little bit more challenging sometimes with commercial property, but the concept would be the same. That, you know, you bought it for this amount, you paid off a good portion of it, you've got this remaining in debt, but it's now worth this, and they're saying we'll loan you right now 75% of what the current market value is minus whatever debt you have remaining and you know be able to pull a substantial amount of money out of that property to be able to do what? Put into another property that you may want to purchase, okay? Or just take the money and run. The uh, 0.75 or 7, uh, the 75%, is that standard? Is that set by the bank? Is that the... I, I know in Texas it's set by the state. Oh, okay. But here in Florida, I'm not 100% sure. Some of you guys may know better than I do on that one. Anybody? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I, just but I, think that, I think you're right. We're right on 75%. No. Yeah. For many years, Texas didn't have home equity loans. They preclude, they, yeah, did not allow you to do it. It's only been the past few years that they've allowed it. And so as a result, it became a huge industry for a, a short period of time. OK. Does the, does the term change? Your... Good question. OK, so the term you know, could be, once again, 
you know, a brand new term, could be within the, the, the term of the original loan, could be, you know, completely separate. So it, it really it depends on, once again, what deal you can get with the lender. But most home equity loans are typically going to be shorter term. In terms of the of the the uh, uh, amortization period, okay. If you, if, if I mean, you the, thing uh, the, the, the one thing you have to keep in mind is it's still a loan. You still have to pay it back. <laughs> you know, you are getting the money, but you know, but, but no, no. But it's, it's an important I think point to make note of. The reason why you would do this is this is going to be a cheaper cost of, of borrowing than let's say you know you want to go buy a boat. Or you want to go buy, you know, I don't know, just virtually anything that you may have to finance. Doing this is probably going to be a much cheaper cost of financing than it, than whatever thing that you're going to potentially purchase. I was just going to say, if, he, if he's already paid 100, if whoever is already paid 150,000, basically 75 percent of the loan already, and then they and if it was the, and he borrowed 175 again and he had to pay it back within what was. The remaining period of the well, I mean, too was, short. Yeah, too short. So it's probably, I mean, the yeah, it's, 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 it's not going to be usually like for 30 years, but they will maybe do, you know, a relatively short time horizon, um, maybe with a bulletin payment in some cases. Huh. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Um, you need a quick little break before the quiz or the quizzes or not? Yeah. Okay. Quick little five minute break. What's up, man? There you go. Good, good. Luckily, what we you? First time I had that. The guy we talked about that did really bad, they did get on the test with me. Because the first thing that came in, I got a 